Hi, I'm Jane Wagner. And I'm Christopher Bird, and welcome to this week's edition of Money to Burn, the show that takes you into the world of money, the people who have it, how they made it, and what they do with it. This week, along with our regular features, we'll have a taped interview with William Coors, president of Coors Beer. We'll also answer our money mail, and I know you'll want to stay tuned for our small change department when we send our 12-year-old roving reporter out to talk to other kids about money. Money to Burn brings you fascinating facts and trivia about the money world, including the bizarre and the extravagant, like the subject of our first story. Fashion's always been associated with big money, and it only seems fitting, if you'll pardon the pun, to start this week's show with a glimpse of one of the big names in high fashion. Here's our own Captain Money with a look at Pierre Cardin. How would you picture Pierre Cardin, the man who sets style for the world? In linen suits, a silk shirt, with a luxury home in Marrakesh, a chauffeured Rolls Royce, and entertaining lavishly? Naturally, you'd think the king of haute couture would live in only the most chic fashion. But this is not the case. Cardin's rather ho-hum due to his absorption with making millions. For transportation around Paris, Cardin prefers one of his delivery trucks. To relax on Sunday, he reorganizes his office. His entire life consists of the workings of Pierre Cardin Limited. The point of all this is the obsessiveness that comes with the ability to make money and keep it. Cardin monitors all daily expenses and has no general manager, financial director, or private banker. He's always at the helm, despite the fact that Cardin Limited employs over 100,000 people, with annual sales topping $560 million. Just how chic is Pierre Cardin? Well, actually, since he's all worker and no player, it makes Pierre rather a dull billionaire. But not all millionaires are boring. We have stories of exciting stunts and money madness for you with Money to Burn's extravaganza. Money, many millionaires have unusual characteristics that intrigue us. Let's look at some of the eccentricities in our extravaganza department. Well, here are some wing dingers. For those of you who don't have anything to munch on, how about this tidbit? The mistress of a French financier was once to be reported to have eaten a 500,000 franc bill. Now, at eight and a half francs to the dollar, that comes to about $60,000. That sounds pretty tasty. How about some tea? Will that be with lemon or milk? If you answered milk at the Rothschilds, you'd be tested further. Jersey, Hereford, or Shorthorn? I think I'll stick to bubbly, thanks. Speaking of bubbly, I hear Gucci has a favorite customer who inaugurates his new pair of loafers by drinking champagne out of them. And then he squeegees home. Very funny, Chris. Personally, I'd rather ride home with Lord Bernard. Then I could be entertained as he played his piano he had installed in his Rolls Royce. Or you could fly home with Hugh Hefner in his favorite private jet, the one with the white rabbit painted on the tail called Big Bunny. That sounds pretty stylish. Well, if it's style you want, how about Andrew Mellon, the industrialist? He manufactured his own automobile without buying any of the supplies. His family manu manufactures all the sources of all the raw materials he needed. Diamond Jim Brady, the railroad car salesman, certainly sparkled when it came to style. He had 30 sets of jewelry. One was on a transportation theme and consisted of studs, cufflinks, buttons, and stick pins in the shape of locomotives, Pullman cars, tank cars, automobiles, bicycles, and airplanes. They were set in platinum and contained 2,637 diamonds, 21 rubies, and valued at $87,000 at the turn of the century. Today, old Diamond Jim would probably f shop for jewelry on Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. This is such an exclusive area that one shop owner feels that his customers should have an income of at least $100,000 a month. Well, that does it for Wealthy Whims. Next, we have a story on the top three millionaires in the country. In recent studies, it's been estimated that there are 520,000 American millionaires. Let's review the statistics regarding the top three in the U.S. Daniel K. Ludwig is actually a billionaire who made his fortune shipbuilding. He lives in New York, is 87 years old, and worth between two and three billion dollars. Forrest E. Mars Sr. of the Mars Candy Empire is worth somewhere between 800 million and one billion. He's 80 years old, lives with his family in Las Vegas. When you're in this wealthy category, anonymity is an asset. Despite great efforts, our researchers were unable to find current photos of either Daniel K. Ludwig or Forrest Mars. We did locate this photograph of the 77-year-old Paul Mellon, the third wealthiest millionaire. 
His family fortune was made in industry and is estimated to be $500 million to $1 billion. He spends most of his time at his 40,000 acre estate in Virginia. How would you define your status of wealth? Stay tuned for Paul Fussell's status quiz after this quick break. Hey, hi, this is Bob Hope. We all know someone with arthritis, but most of us don't know where to turn for help. The place is the Arthritis Foundation. They can give you the best answers available today, and they can give you hope for tomorrow. Researchers supported by the Arthritis Foundation are making exciting progress, but they need your help. Arthritis is a serious problem, and the Arthritis Foundation deserves your serious support. So give generously today. Someone you know will thank you. In the world of money, status symbols give others an idea of where you stand. Our next feature will give you a chance to rate yourself and see how you're doing. So get ready to take Paul Fussell's status quiz. Now what's this status quiz all about, Jane? Well, Chris, according to Paul Fussell and his book class, starting with 100 points and adding or subtracting depending on his criteria, you come up with a, your own social status. Sounds kind of interesting. Let's try it. Okay. Items scored include works of art, original drawings, prints, or lithographs. Add five points. Picasso reproductions, subtract two. Any artwork depicting cowboys, subtract three. What about day glow on velvet? Please. There are also standards for the kinds of periodicals visible in your house, ranging from the National Enquirer, subtract six, to Paris Match, add six. It doesn't mention Playboy here. <coughs> Chris. For no periodicals, subtract six points. For a refrigerator, washing machine, or dryer in your living room, subtract six. Clear plastic covers on furniture, subtract six. For every item alluding to the United Kingdom, add one. Is this guy English? For every item alluding even remotely to King Tut, subtract four points. Well, we know he's not Egyptian. For each frame certificate or diploma, subtract two points. Well, it's about time. For overflow books stacked on the chairs, etc., add six points. Great. Comic books excluded. Oh. Well, if you scored over 245 points, you would be in the upper class. How'd you do, Chris? Well, have you got the time? Speaking of time, if the old adage, time is money, is true, then certainly it applies to Callista, Greek for the most beautiful. This unique lady's watch was designed by the French artist Raymond Moretti and made by the 225-year-old Swiss watchmaking firm of Vacheron Constantine. It consists of 118 rectangular shaped diamonds, which literally took years to collect. Millions of tons of ore were processed and approximately 6,000 man hours were required to mount the diamonds in the 140 grams of beautifully sculptured yellow gold. The estimated value of the watch is $8 million, and as an investment, the watch increases its value by approximately $4,000 a day. You know, having a lot of money can make you the subject of controversy. Money to Burns' Pat Franklin caught up with and chatted with Bill Coors about what he felt the ingredients were for his personal success. Speaking before the Entrepreneur Club of San Diego, Mr. Bill Coors, Chairman of the Board and Chief Executive Officer of the Adolph Coors Company, shared some insights about himself, his family, and his company that incidentally grossed $1 billion last year. Um, Bill, why don't you just give me a little bit of background in terms of where you uh, were born, when you started uh, working for the brewery, and so on. First, the brewery was uh founded by my grandfather, uh, he was a German immigrant, in 1873. Mm -hmm. I was born on the brewery premises in, uh, I hate to tell you this, 1916. Do you consider yourself successful? Uh, that's a tough question, Pat. No, I don't. I, uh, I, uh, I've had a fabulous life, and uh, I, I've got so many blessings. I, I'm so grateful for all that I have, uh, but uh, uh, I would hate to ever be in a position where I can say, gee, I'm a success, you know. There's so many things that I haven't accomplished. Um, there's, uh, there, uh, there's a lack of fulfillment, there's a frustration of not getting things done that I would like to get done. So I don't perceive myself as being successful. I just 
perceive myself as being tremendously fortunate. Do you think your wealth has changed you in any way, especially with how people view you uh, and, and how you view yourself? No, I, uh, I don't think it's changed the way I view myself. Uh, I'm some kind, sometimes a little bit, uh, I don't know, maybe frightened is not the word for it, but a little bit uh, uh, shocked at uh, the perception people have of me where they associate my presumed wealth uh, with power. I do not associate wealth with power in any sense of the word. I don't think you, uh, you don't buy power. Uh, power or whatever they're talking about as far as power is concerned I mean, it comes from leadership. It comes from human values. It comes from what you stand for. It doesn't come from what you can buy. Um, do you think you're extravagant in any way? You know, what's Ex extravagant in any way? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, I'm probably one of the most unextravagant persons that I know of. I, uh, do you remember the moment when you felt that you had made it? Pat, I've never felt that I've made it. I, I, I have, uh, there's always been so much out in front of me. And one of the things I, I remember so clearly through and so vividly through my life, and I, I still get it today, that when you do achieve a goal, uh, there isn't really time to rest and, and enjoy that goal because there's another one out ahead of you. So I, I just have one more question. Um, yeah, Pat. What are the primary ingredients in your words uh, for success? Well, golly, Pat, there's so many of them. Uh, integrity, obviously, is one. I mean, you have to have an Im impeccable integrity. Uh, you have to be, uh, you have to be perceived in an honest, as an honest person. You have to be perceived as a caring person. Mm -hmm. And if you want to be perceived as an honest person and perceived as a caring person, you have to be an honest person. Yes. You have to be a caring person. There's only one person in the world that you can't con or you can't deceive. And that's the person who looks back at you when you look in the mirror, you see. As long as you can look at that person and hold yourself up and be proud of what you are and proud of what you stand for, I mean, then you got it. Thank you very much. I've got a lot of other questions to ask you. Perhaps I can talk to you after your speech. All I think right. we're going to wrap it up right now. Very good. Okay. Thanks. Nice to see you, Dan. <laughs> Take care. Good luck. Thanks, Pat. Well, it's been good weather for sailing. How much would it cost to have my own yacht, Chris? Well, let's take a 92-foot yacht recently built in Newport Beast as an example. The estimated cost for design and construction was about $3.5 million. Just to keep it in a slip will cost $12,000 a year. Then there's the skipper and crew's salaries at $60,000 a year. And of course, the cost of your electronic security system, the two bars, the dance floor, and the fully furnished bedrooms, kitchens, and baths. And don't forget the custom interior decoration with special cabinets to prevent china from breaking and the suede upholstered walls and white carpeting at $425 a square yard. So get out your checkbook, Jane. You'll be spending just over $4 million on your yacht this year. Hmm, I think I'll stick to windsurfing. Do you dream of flying to faraway places? Let's turn to Sam Kephart on location at Lindbergh Field. As you can see, it's very easy to get in the front seat and drive 12 million bucks. It feels wonderful. And it's yours for only $6,000 an hour. Come join us. Frequently when we travel the airports, we get a chance to see private jets those small business jets that buzz in and out of the major airports around the United States. But it isn't too often we get a first-hand view of just what it's like to be aboard a private corporate jet. We're currently standing on the air stair of a Falcon 50 intercontinental three-engine private jet, which has the capacity to fly nonstop, for instance, between Los Angeles and Honolulu, or shall we say New York and Paris. In addition, a jet has what is called the management accountability factor. It gives management a much greater flexibility and multiplication of their time so that literally an executive can have breakfast meeting in Los Angeles, a luncheon meeting in Denver, a dinner meeting in Chicago, and be in New York in time to get a good night's rest for a board meeting the following day. So if you'll join us, we're going to take a tour of the Falcon 50. 
We're now aboard the rear lounge of the Falcon 50, which, by the way, is a three-engine private jet. Uh, many of the motor components and some of the other key engine and power system components are designed and provided by and installed on the plane by the Garrett Air Research Corporation. The actual airframe is built in France by Dassault Aviation, which is a wholly owned subsidiary of the French government as part of their aviation group. A plane like this has very sophisticated air and ground instrumentation systems, uh, particularly communications is very important aboard this type of craft. And speaking of communications, I have a face-to-face -face luncheon meeting in New Orleans in about three and a half hours. So I'll see you there. Bye. Thank you, Sam. This week's Money Mail had two good questions that we'd like to answer on the air. Do you remember the pet rock? A viewer asked how much money the pet rock made. Gary Dahl, the creator, made $1.8 million in two months between October 1st and December 1st of 1975. Another viewer wanted to know what the taxes would be on a million dollars. Well, you would owe Uncle Sam about $350,000, give or take a dime. If you have any questions you want answered, send them to Money Mail. 405 West Washington Street, Suite 116, San Diego, California, 92103. Not everyone acquires wealth through their own work or inheritance. Today we have the well-known instructor of the class, How to Marry Money, Barbara Jones. Welcome to Money to Burn, Barbara. How are you today? Fine, thank you. Well, I know every mother and daughter across the country is dying to know the answer to the question, where do you find this man? Well, I think that's a very good question to begin with. I think that uh, most women who come to the class, the first question they want answered is, where are they? And I can say that uh, if you live in California, particularly in this area, you're in a very good spot. New York has the most millionaires in the uh, United States, and California is second. At one time, La, La Jolla had more retired millionaires than any other place in the, the, the uh, nation. Mm -hmm. And in your class, I understand that you talk about three steps that these young ladies or whatever age ladies should uh, consider when they're considering looking for a man with money. What are they? All right, I think they're the same when you're looking for a good man in any case. However, in this particular pursuit, I'd say, first of all, self-presentation, doing everything you can to make yourself attractive, well-groomed, and above all, developing your own individuality, trying to be unique and developing charm. Secondly, uh, you need to position yourself. You need to be an active person, go many places, do many things, and as you are doing that, uh, increase your network of friends. There are two ways of doing this, of course, horizontally, as most of us do in our social life. We meet people who are in similar circumstances. Uh, we meet their friends and we extend our uh, acquaintanceship. However, uh, uh, networking horizontally is another angle to this. You're a little bit more aggressive in your networking and you are seeking to find people that can help you to improve yourself and that uh, will introduce you to people that would be suitable. Uh -huh, I see. Um, are there unique characteristics about the men that fall into the wealthy category that you'd like to explain to us? Well, very briefly, uh, men who are entrepreneurs or the money personality is a very distinct type. These men are very ambitious, very energetic, very focused. They like change. And if you marry a man who is a successful businessman, chances are his business comes first and you come second, and you have to accept that. <laughs> I see. Sometimes that's a little bit of a bitter pill to swallow, but you need to know that going into it, I suppose. Yes. Um, now, if we wanted to take your class, can you tell us briefly how we would Register. Register, yes. Uh, through Access, which is a learning network here in San Diego, it's in the telephone book under Access, and they register and collect the fees. I see. Well, thank you, Barbara, for being with us on Money to Burn. And we'll be right back after this quick break. Now I have a question for you. Can you name the six main traits of a tycoon? Stay tuned, and I'll be right back with the answer after this short break. <laughs> It's a bird! It's a plane! It's Superman! Kids with asthma don't have to sit out the good times. Now there's a fun self-help kit full of games and puzzles from the American Lung Association. Every Super Stuff kit comes with information that helps kids and parents learn about asthma. Follow your doctor's orders and get some coaching from Super Stuff. Contact your American Lung Association. 
Okay, now for that question we asked you. What are the six main traits of a tycoon? Well, here's the answer. Number one, ambition. Number two, extreme self-confidence. Number three, cardiovascular and emotional stamina. Number four, an uncanny ability to think quickly and logically. Number five, excessive energy. And number six, being an extrovert. Have you ever had fantasies of being a land baron? Of the 2.3 billion acres comprising the United States, 762 million acres are in public domain. Who owns the one and one quarter billion acres that are remaining? Well, here's a breakdown of the major private landowners. Nelson and Bunker Hunt reportedly own 3.5 million acres, about four and a half times the size of Rhode Island. The Coe and Pingree families own 1.1 million acres of timberland in Maine. The biggest ranch in the country is the King Ranch in Texas and encompasses 823,000 acres. Robert O. Anderson of Arco appears to own more than one million acres of ranch land spreading across Texas, New Mexico, and Colorado. By far, the biggest landowners are oil companies and paper companies. The top 20 each own from 2 to 40 million acres. A few of these top 20 are Exxon, Gulf Oil, Mobil, Texaco, Standard Oil, Burlington Northern, International Paper, Boise Cascade, and the St. Regis Paper Company. It doesn't matter how much of it you have, it seems that everybody has an opinion or a comment on the subject of money. Here's Money to Burn's Terry Griffin with some of your views on money. Hi, what's your name? Chris. Chris, how would you spend a million dollars? What would be the first three things you would buy if you had a million dollars? I'd probably buy me a nice car, probably a, a nice house to live in, probably make a good investment somewhere. And what's your name? Marv. Marv, what would be the first three things you would buy if you had a million dollars? Oh, I'd get a 930S Turbo Carrera, nice house over somewhere on the coast up by uh, San Francisco, and go on vacation for a couple of years. And what's your name? My name's Scott. Hey, what about you? What would you do? Uh, I think I would get all of my family out of debt, uh, buy me a house, and invest a lot of money in real estate. What do you think it takes to become a millionaire? Probably a lot of education, probably, um, a lot of social responsibility. How about you? What do you think it takes? Pure luck. And how about you? <laughs> um, I think just making, getting the right lead on a good investment, setting in stock or something like that. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, what's your name? Luke. Luke, how would you make a million dollars? Oh, I'd probably just work really hard. <laughs> what would be the first three things you would buy if you had a million dollars? I wouldn't really buy anything. I'd put it in the bank and let it earn more money. And then afterwards, I would buy a car and a house. What's your name? Uh, Joel. Um, the first thing I do, I'd probably buy some clothes and buy a TV station and retire for the rest of my life. What do you think it takes to become a millionaire? Uh, a lot of education, hard work, even more so now than about 50 years ago, I say. Thank you. Hi, what's your name? Gloria. What do you think it takes to become a millionaire? A uh, combination of preparation, work, and answering when opportunity knocks. What would be the first three things you would buy if you had a million dollars? A new house. I'd secure the children's uh, education funds and probably retirement funds for us. Hi, what's your name? I'm Jerry. How about you, Jerry? What would you buy if you had a million dollars? Three things. First thing I think I'd do would be buy my wife uh, all the things she's looking at in the mail order catalogs <laughs> for dresses. Uh, secondly, I know we'd buy a new home. And the third thing, I agree with her that uh, we would put our children's, we got four children, uh, their college fund in, into being. How about you? What do you think it takes to become a millionaire? I think organization. The ability first to clearly think what you're doing and then plan a course of action and then go out and do it. This has been Terry Griffin for Money to Burn. Thank you, Terry. If you were 10 years old and were given a billion dollars, what would you do? Here's Russell with a few answers from the kids on the street in our section called Small Change. What would you do with a million dollars? Candy. You would buy some candy? Oh boy, what would you do? Buy a uh, motorcycle. What color motorcycle? Blue. Why a blue one? Because I like blue. Oh. Okay. What would you do with a million dollars? I'll buy a horsey, a dog. 
A horse and a dog. Okay. Sit down. What would you do? With a million dollars? Yes. Oh. Um, well, I'd buy a dog for the first place, and then I'd buy a house and a yacht and, okay. and a car. Okay. What would you do? Uh, buy a yacht. A yacht? Would it have lots of rooms on it? Yeah. How many? A hundred. A hundred rooms. What would you do? Um, buy a horsey. A horsey? Would you buy anything else? Um, a motorcycle. Oh, a motorcycle. Can you... T <laughs> Hello? <laughs> can you tell him? <laughs> can you tell who is a millionaire? Who is a millionaire? Yeah. The bank. A bank man? Yeah. Okay. Do you think you know who a millionaire is? A bank girl. A bank girl. Okay. How about you? Well, um, probably a millionaire would probably be a person who throws their money away on things that don't really matter. Okay. Well, how about you? Have nice clothes. What do you think a millionaire is? I don't know. You don't know? Okay. This is Russell Benton for Money to Burn. Thank you, Russell. Well, Jane, that wraps up another edition of Money to Burn. You know, I still can't get over some of the things those kids said about money. Weren't they great? Glad you could join us this week. Watch your local listings for the next time we bring you Money to Burn. Spin!